Hi, everyone. Welcome back to part two of the first lecture. So I left off last about to talk about different symptoms of trauma. And the most important thing to know is that not everybody reacts the same way. And we'll go through these different definitions um, one slide at a time. Okay. So the first one that I want to talk about is actually faulty brain alarm systems. So this one right here. And for those of you who don't remember much about the brain, if you have learned about it, this is just a quick little refresher. The amygdala is the smoke detector in our brain and it's in the limbic system that identifies input relevant for survival. It will sense danger, sends a message to the hypothalamus and the brain stem to recruit the stress hormone system and the autonomic nervous system to activate flight or fight, also freeze or fawn are included in that category. So we often just say fight or flight, but freeze or fawn is also um, possibilities, which I'll explain more as we get further. It identifies danger prior to conscious awareness of danger by the frontal lobe. So by the time we realize what's happening, our body may already be on the move. And trauma increases the risk of misinterpreting whether a particular situation is dangerous or safe. This image is from the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And it kind of is a really good drawing actually of how your brain sends signals to the rest of your body. Um, to demonstrate that trauma actually affects the entire human organism, body, mind, and brain. In PTSD, the body continues to defend against a threat that belongs in the past, and healing from PTSD means being able to terminate this continued stress mobilization and restore the entire organism to safety. As you can see in this photo, there are signals, hormonal and otherwise chemical, sent to your facial muscles, maybe communicating need for defense or protection, to the thyroid, to the heart and lungs, increasing oxygen for fight or flight, the GI tract slowing down, the adrenal glands releasing stress hormones, and so much more. It also means your executive functioning is disengaged, so it may be difficult to think clearly, and that is exactly the purpose of this mechanism, is like you don't have time to think, you just got to act, or something's got to happen in flight or fight. So the stress reaction is actually occurring in less than 1 20th of a second. It is an immediate reaction and fight or flight or freeze. I only have three of them listed here, but recently fawn has been a new addition to the stress reaction. And fawn is sort of like people pleasing in a way where um, you're just like doing whatever, saying yes, doing anything you can to basically not get annihilated. Um, and freeze is basically kind of like shutting down and we all know fight or flight. A response takes at least a couple minutes because that's how long it takes for information to be transferred from our sensory perceptions and subconscious to conscious thought. So just know that your stress reactions are normal. They're there to protect you, yet we need to understand them because we need to understand how we respond in moments of stress. You could potentially respond 
using all of the forms of stress reactions, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. But we do tend to lean more to one or the other, or we tend to have ones like for me, for instance, it's definitely flight. Um, but I am also prone to occasionally fawning, freezing, and fighting. So just take a moment to think about what your primary stress reaction is. The second type of response I want to talk about is the speechless horror or lack of language to have no words. Uh, this is also a picture from the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And I really wanted to share it because I just thought it was such an interesting part in the book where they did some brain imaging studies 13 years after a traumatic event by re-traumatizing a patient to relive the event. Uh, the biggest area of activation is in the right limbic area, the amygdala, during this event of reliving. Uh, there is decreased activity. In this case, the color indicated decreased activity instead of an increase in the left frontal lobe of the cortex in a region called the Broca's area, which is one of the speech centers of the brain. It's actually really interesting because stroke victims will lose ability to speak if their blood supply is cut to the Broca's area. But like that exact situation happens in a traumatic stress response or can happen where you there's no like physical blockage of blood supply but basically the end result is the same the broadman's area 19 is activated in the visual cortex where images are registered as well so that's why sometimes flashbacks are images and you can't really explain your trauma because you've lost your ability to speak and that can happen during the event even after even trying to recall the event so I just thought it was really interesting I wanted to share that speechless horror can under extreme conditions can show up as people screaming obscenities calling for their mothers just howling in terror or simply shutting down. Um, where I come from, like in the Turkish culture, this is extremely common, like to see on the news when people have suffered great losses and it's being documented, you might just hear them wailing. Um, for instance, with the earthquake recently, a lot of images on the news and social media uh, depicted this. When words fail, haunting images capture the experience and can return as nightmares and flashbacks. Other unprocessed sense fragments of trauma like sounds and smells and physical sensations can also trigger a flashback. Another symptom of trauma is shifting to one side of the brain. So that basically means understanding right brain versus left brain. Trauma has been shown to also activate the right hemisphere of the brain and deactivate the left. So our right hemisphere is the intuitive, emotional, visual, spatial, artistic side. It's the first to develop in the womb and carries a nonverbal communication between parents and infants. It stores memories of sound, touch, and smell. Left brain is our rational, logical, linguistic, analytical side, remembers facts, stats, vocab, and sequencing of events. What does this all mean in trauma? Deactivation of the left hemisphere has a direct impact on the capacity to organize an experience into logical sequences. Broca's area, which blacks out during trauma, is on the left side of the brain. Not saying this happens every time, but this is a very common occurrence. And I'm mostly sharing the most common occurrences. It can often feel like you're losing your mind because you have loss of executive function, which is in your higher brain. And 
when something reminds traumatized people of the past, their right brain reacts as if the traumatic event were happening in the present. But because the left brain isn't working very well, they might not be aware they're experiencing or reenacting the past. They are furious, terrified, enraged, ashamed, or frozen. After the emotional storm passes, they may look for something or somebody to blame. This is one of the reasons why talk therapy doesn't always help resolve trauma and a multimodal approach is best, which we'll get more into when we're talking about healing modalities. So controlling the, sm the stress response is a effect that also happens. So if the amygdala is the smoke detector of our brain, think of the frontal lobes and specifically our medial prefrontal cortex, which is up here located directly above our eyes. Think of it as the watchtower. So our amygdala is a smoke detector and up here we have our watchtower. In PTSD and STSD, the critical balance between the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex shifts radically, which makes it harder to control emotions and impulses. Even with everything that I know now, I still struggle with this, so don't be too hard on yourselves. Sometimes when I'm just extremely thrown into like an old trauma response, I, I still can struggle with controlling my emotions or my impulses, but I have since learning this information gotten exponentially better, and I see it in my life and my relationships reflect in a very positive way. And effectively dealing with stress depends on restoring this balance, which we'll talk more about when we're on the healing section of the lecture, which will be the second lecture. So coming back to our symptoms of trauma side, we talked about faulty brain alarm systems, we talked about speechless horror, we talked about shifting to one side of the brain, inappropriate stress response, inability to control the stress response, and we're in the middle here now. We have a few more to cover. Again, emphasizing that not everyone reacts the same way and you won't always have the same response every time. So sensory overload is another one. In normal circumstances, the thalamus also acts as a filter or gatekeeper. This is in the brain. And it makes it a central component of attention, concentration, new learning, all of which are compromised by trauma. It helps to distinguish between sensory information that is relevant and information that you can safely ignore. So if you hear like a loud bang, for instance, you're not going to jump 100 feet every time you hear a loud noise. But depending on the sensory information that's relevant, your brain kind of decides with immense quickness <laughs> if you can ignore it or not. People with PTSD or SDSD have their floodgates wide open, they lack a filter, and they're on constant sensory overload. So in order to cope, they try and shut themselves down, develop hyperfocus and a tunnel vision, often turning to drugs or alcohol to block out the world. The tragedy is that the price of shutting down includes filtering out sources of pleasure and joy as well. So... Sensory overload is definitely something that I have dealt with and still deal with. Um, sometimes I think that I need to do things to actually dampen all the information, especially in this day and age. We can get so much information overload even without trauma. We can get sensory overload even without trauma. Um, so, for instance, like noise-canceling headphones are great for me, especially when I travel. It helps me, like, I'm still aware of my surroundings, but it kind of helps me drown out some of the noise that can be very overwhelming for me. So, that's one little suggestion. 
Another symptom of trauma is the loss of self, the numbing feeling, the feeling of being dead inside, especially in situations that warrant emotion. In this profession, we'll often talk about like, oh, we're really just all dead inside, which is, you know, we need that kind of dark humor sometimes to get through, but it is also important to pay attention. Like, is that just a joke or no it's not it's like what can really happen and outwardly it can manifest as blank stares absent minds difficulty li living in the present it can leave you feeling disembodied as well disassociation disassociation and reliving is another two symptoms that can happen disassociation is the essence of trauma the overwhelming experience is split off and fragmented so that emotions sounds images thoughts and physical sensations related to tra the trauma take a life of their own the sensory fragments of memory intrude into the present where they are literally relived on a regular basis as long as the trauma is not resolved the stress hormones in your body will secrete to protect itself and it will keep circulating and the defensive movements and emotional response keep getting replayed. One may have no idea why they respond to some minor irritation as if they were about to be annihilated. And reliving trauma is another big topic in the Body Keeps the Score book. Um, I don't have a lot of time to get into it right now, but it is important to take a note of that reliving trauma has been shown to be a symptom of trauma. And you would think like, oh, why would I want to relive a bad event? Um, I don't really know the answer to that. But one of the speculations is that it because it secretes like adrenaline and all these hormones and activates fight or flight it gives this feeling of like being alive um so people tend to feel dead inside until they kind of relive their trauma on a regular basis and then without even realizing they're just going in the cycle that a uh, pattern of reliving and it's just wreaking havoc on the body, on the nervous system, and eventually will catch up with the body because the body keeps the score. Another symptom is loss of feeling safe. Being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. I will say that again. Being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Social support is the most powerful protection against becoming overwhelmed by stress and trauma. This is why I was saying there is never too much support. You, there is never too much help. The problem is that people do not seek help. They don't have the support. They don't know how to ask for the support. And trauma can make you feel like the world is just a gathering of aliens. But the critical issue here is reciprocity, acts of kindness. No matter what, being able to feel supported, to perform acts of kindness is very critical. Whether you're the one suffering from the trauma or you're witnessing someone else, please just remember this, a simple act of kindness, like maybe get them a glass of water or get them something they need in that moment. You can do something so big for someone by just doing something small. Just remember that. And in the past two decades, research has shown that when people become too skittish or shut down to derive comfort from other humans, relationships with mammals can help or animals in general. So we got something going right there, at least <laughs> with our animals in our lives. And lastly, the reorganization of perception. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. 
trauma changes people's perceptions and imagination. So I want to do this inkblot test. It is a bit weird doing it on video, but I still want to go through it. It's also known as a Rorschach test, and it provides us with a unique way to observe how people construct a mental image from what's basically a meaningless stimulus, such as a blot of ink. Traumatized people have a tendency to superimpose their trauma on things around them. And this test is still widely used outside of the United States. It's just kind of controversial in the U.S., and if you want to refer to the page in the book, it's page 15 uh, from The Body Keeps the Score. It will get more into detail about how the lens in which we view the world changes based on the reorganization of our perception because of trauma and not necessarily in a good way. So here's the first inkblot test. I'll give you a moment. Just think of the first image that you see and write that down. And normally I would, when doing this lecture live, discuss, you know, what people see. And it's just really interesting to get different inputs on what people see from a meaningless blot of ink, supposedly meaningless and how we assign meaning to things that we see, trauma or not, it's just how our brain works. This is the second image, and it's the first image with color in it. Every time I look at this image, I maybe it's because I work in emergency, but I always see like a dog laying on a gurney, but like mirror images of the dog and bleeding. Yeah, that, the other day I was like taking a shower and I was like looking at the tile, which is totally just a blur of different colors. And I was just seeing dogs everywhere. And I think I was just so exhausted and I just worked a ton of shifts. And I was like, dogs, 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 there's dogs everywhere in my shower. And that's because I predominantly work with dogs. I think my brain was just superimposing what I have been seeing repeatedly on while I was taking a shower onto my wall. I don't see that every time I take a shower, but I just noticed when that happened recently. And this is the third image from the Rorschach test. It's interesting. This one is like, they say that if you see like a large, like menacing figure, that maybe that could have something to do with your feelings around authority or maybe some negative feelings on some larger kind of monster type image. Some people see penguins, you know, it's just interesting. So what did you see? Let me know if you feel like letting me know, or if you have any comments about this lecture and the different symptoms, please, I'm always just open to hearing what different people learn and experience. And it helps me as well knowing that the information is getting across as well. So the good news is that this increase of research and knowledge around trauma has opened up new possibilities to palliate or even reverse the damage. Yay! <laughs> No, we don't know exactly how long that takes, but there's lots of different modalities, which I'll talk about in the more fun healing part, because sometimes this stuff can get a little bit heavy and aren't always so fun. But the cool thing is that we can now develop methods and experiences that utilize the brain's own natural neuroplasticity to help survivors feel fully alive in the present moment, moment and move on with their lives. Neuroplasticity is huge, and I will be talking about that more in the second lecture. So this is the end of our first lecture, and thank you so much for tuning in, for listening, and I'll see you in the second lecture about neuroplasticity, healing, and more hope and positivity. So talk soon. Bye.